Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Podcast, the first guest of the day to talk all things NHL, ESPN's John Butchacross. How are you doing today? Great. Great? That is great. All right, the Stanley Cup final just happened. The Blues win their first Stanley Cup ever. What, are your, what were your thoughts on the, uh, the Stanley Cup final? Well, certainly uh, the Blues had a historic comeback from where they were in January. Um, I wonder if long-term it will affect the way a lot of teams build their teams this offseason. If, if it's going to be a, a trend, I don't know if it's a great trend, where teams really play a defensive style, uh, not high-risk taking game, and, uh, and try to win that way. Um, I, I wonder, you know, with the hard salary cap league and teams having talent spread out in some areas, you might be deficient because some areas you pay more because of the cap. And certain players, if if we're, we're going to see this, it'll don't take too many chances. Uh, even if you only get yourself three to five good chances, uh, trying to capitalize on those and just play a real safe, stay home, stay home game. I hope the the recent trend in the last few years where the game got really fast and exciting and explosive, I hope it doesn't return to a little more conservative approach. Yeah, that was an interesting final. I wouldn't have thought that the Blues would have won it if not for the uh, heroics of Jordan Binghamton, especially in Game 7 when Boston was just getting at them early and then the Blues got going later in that first period. Then you're thinking, oh, maybe the Blues will get this. But yeah... That was a, a fun Stanley Cup final, seven games. And let's talk about the draft. So it's going to be Jack Hughes and Capo Caco going first and second. Who do you think goes third? That's going to be very interesting, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Chicago certainly could use a few things. Obviously, defenseman is something they're focusing on. It's one reason why they traded for Oli Mata. Uh, a guy who can block shots and have a little bit of experience. Not the fastest skater, but it gives them something they didn't have last year. Uh, from there, you know, so if you go for a real young defenseman, they can take a while to develop, and, and Kane and Taves are now at that age where their window is closing. So unless you plan on trading one of them, probably more likely Kane than Taves, uh, he would get the better return. You might would want to go with a center, a second-line center. And uh, there's a couple there that could play behind Taves. If you take a smaller Turcotte, um, there's certainly an option. Uh, kind of a prototypical, you know, 5'11 guy. Or do you go to a big six foot three right-handed shot centerman? Um, I think that's the choice for them. And I think they'll go in one of those two directions. Yeah, and I've heard Turcotte compared to Jonathan Taves, so that's really, really interesting that you mentioned him as the possibility of him going third. I think that's realistic for them as well. What do you make of the Jonathan Taves comparison for uh, for Turcotte? Yeah, it's uh, always obviously tough to, uh, you know, obviously they're about the same size, and, and certainly uh, Taves has had a great career. Not a prolific offensive player. Uh, he finally came back a little bit last year. But, you know, for a lot of years, he was a very, you know, he was an average to below average offensive player. Patrick Kane is really the, you know, the true superstar on that team. And, uh, and so Taves has always been in a good spot in that regard. He hasn't had a lot of pressure to score. So, uh, you know, they just need to obviously accumulate good players again. Um, after kind of a couple years now of not being really relevant in the West and see if they can kind of do it on the fly uh, without trading you know, Kane or Taves. Uh, that's going to be the, the, the challenge for them is can they do that? Can they return here and get one more run with these guys? Yeah, and I think they're certainly in play to sign one of these big-name free agents this offseason. Not Bravovsky. I don't think he's in play for them, but like a Panarin or maybe somebody that's available via trade, like maybe like a P.K. Subban. Like, I could just see them going big-name hunting this summer. And speaking of trades, do you think there's any of the top 15 picks that get traded? On Friday night? What was that? Lottery picks being traded. Do you think any of the lottery picks get traded? Anyone between 1 and 15? That's a good point. Um, obviously, again, teams who might be a veteran away, I think there's always a team you can match up with who's looking to shed some salary, um, get younger, get faster. So I think yeah, I think that's always in play. You can see that. If, if, if a team, you know, teams 
know how important it is to draft and develop and to get guys who hit, and then you have them cheap for a few years. That's so important. And you can go out and get a, a big-time uh, player and really add depth to your roster like Tampa Bay was able to do. Now all those salaries are now coming uh, you know, to a to place uh, to a place now you have to pay these guys like drop obviously kicks in and, and points and these people so it's tough so you like to have that window when you have some cheap guys who are really pumping in the goals so it's tough to trade those uh, top 15 picks when you have a chance to do that for a guy who's already making five or six and um, and if he doesn't produce then it's really uh, you're really behind the eight ball and, and you don't have that prospect you don't have that chance to get that guy who scores while he's cheap which is important, in all, whether it's NFL football with the quarterback, if you hit on him, and then you save your salary cap space or in the NHL. So I think there's always a chance you could do that probably whenever you want to trade trade a top 15 pick for an established guy like a, like a Kyle Palmieri for New Jersey if they want to do that. Um, certainly there would be a team that would love Kyle Palmieri. Get a 30-goal score that maybe could help them or, or someone like that. So, uh um, yeah, I think there's always a chance of that, especially if a GM is in a situation where he needs to win or he's getting, like, if you see Philadelphia making lots of trades. It looks like they're going to, I wonder if they're going, like, a, after the St. Louis Blue model. We have this great young goaltender. We're going to put these experienced pieces in front of him, Braun and Niskin in, and who knows, there might be more. And so they might be a team that's looking to get older and, and kind of mix in the young guys with the older guys and then create this team that, uh, has a chance if everything goes right to advance uh, as opposed to just thinking well we don't have the superstars so there's no way we can compete so let's tear it down and just uh and just tank but st louis showed that you know if you get, to get these guys who can play a little bit uh, you know bozak and Peron, and you have the younger guys on the on the bottom part of the, of the roster then maybe you can get hot and do something yeah and Speaking of, like, lottery picks and trades, I feel like that happens every year in hockey. I remember a few years ago, the Rangers, they traded away Derek Stepan and Antti Ranta. I think that was for the seventh pick. And then a few years ago, I remember Boston got two lottery picks. I remember San Jose and the Kings were involved. But I feel like it's like it happens every single year. That's why I have a feeling that it's probably going to happen again this year with the lottery picks being traded around the time of the draft. And you have a sleeper prospect in mind, a prospect that's not like a Capco or a Hughes that could surprise and end up being like a very good player down the road? I think Cole Caulfield's one of the more interesting players. He's scored a million goals for the U.S. development team this year, playing with Jack Hughes and with a good team. Um, he's very small. Uh, he's going to Wisconsin this fall to play college hockey. Um, it's just a matter of who's going to take a chance on this five foot seven inch guy, and who has a great shot. But he's a little guy who's a finisher. And will some teams be spooked by that? Will you know, will he be able to get into the areas to use that shot? Um, so he's really an interesting player. How high will he go? Would you score that many goals if he was six feet, one ninety? He might be the second pick of the draft or the third pick of the draft. When you're that little, it's going to scare some teams. And so. Well, the Kings take a chance at him to get younger and more dynamic. Um, as you know, as they've aged and they're trying to post Stanley Cup uh, era, they're trying to get back. And while they still have some of those pieces, who are still certainly good, like Kopitar. So will they take a jump on it? Will he slip to the Sabres? Will, and, and will they feel pressure, you know, to, to pick the right guy, obviously? And Jason Botterill, his, his job is on the line now, probably as a GM. If they don't make the playoffs this year, he'll be gone. So he's got to make the right pick. And will he pick a guy he thinks he can help him now as opposed to taking the guy who's going to college? That's tough when a GM knows he's on a short road. Is he drafting for himself or truly doing the right thing for the team? And, uh, and they're usually going to do the right thing for the team because they want to get another job if this one doesn't work out. But I think that Cole Caulfield's an interesting player to watch because he's so little but yet so prolific. Where did he go? Yeah, and another interesting prospect is somebody that's also on that U.S. national development team, and that's Spencer Knight. There's a lot of hype around him. Do you see him being a top 15 pick or a late first round pick, like a Calgary or a Carolina type of pick? Yeah, this, you know, it, it, a lot of times it's, it's by position and need. I think teams are starting to pick more by need now. Like, what do we need to uh, defense? Could, could, could this center join us in two years? 
we could picture him being at our team in two years, or is he a, he's one year of it somewhere, whether it's college or junior, can he step right in right away? Does he have the body to do that? Um, so, yeah, so it, I think it's just going to depend on team and need and fit is, is when a player kind of drops. Yeah, I totally agree with you about that. What do you make of Kirby Doc? I hear his name rumbling around about him possibly going three or even four to the Avalanche. What do you make about Kirby Doc? Yeah, I think Doc, it's Doc or Turcotte at three for Chicago. Again, Doc is that big six foot three, 200 foot guy. And that might be a guy that, you know, in, like, like I said, as the NHL looks like, I just wonder if we're going to go back to a bigger, slower, more physical game like St. Louis played. It'll be like a copycat situation. Um, Will that will those big guys start to look appealing again, uh, especially when it comes to playoff time? You can wear teams down, and it is about injuries. And a bigger guy with an injury might be more effective than a little guy with an injury who needs his quickness. A big guy doesn't need his quickness, so he can withstand an injury and still play. Little, little things like that. So I do think for the Blackhawks, just not many times a guy like Doc, six foot three, right-handed shot centerman, comes along. So I think that's what Chicago is trying to deal with. Do we take Turcotte? Probably a safe pick. No, but he's got to be good. But could Doc have some upside, um, you know, over that just because he, of his physical features? So that's going to be an interesting take there at three. And then what Colorado does, I think Colorado could use another center. So I, I, I would think they would take who Chicago doesn't and could fit right in behind, uh, you know, behind McKinnon. So, uh, and, and so they can start to get some depth down the middle. So that's what I think might happen there with, uh, with, with certainly with the uh, Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, the Avs are the Avs are certainly a team to watch going in the next year. I think they have to be considered among the uh, favorites to crowd the West. I really like the direction of that team. Speaking of like teams and directions, the New York Rangers made a big trade yesterday, acquiring Jake or Trubo, Jacob Trubo from the Winnipeg Jets. For the pick they originally got for Kevin Hayes and going back to Winnipeg as well as Neil Pionk, what do you make of that deal for uh, the Rangers? Yeah, it's a great trade for the Rangers. This is a guy who's entering his prime. He had 50 points last year. He can kind of play that Ryan McDonough role, big, strong, play every situation, not super-duper dynamic offensively, but certainly very solid. And, again, he's you know entering his mid-20s, so I'm sure they'll sign him to a long-term deal here. Um, in the coming days, get him locked up, and he'll be kind of that guy for uh, the next you know seven years. So uh, to get that guy for really just the 20th pick is outstanding. You know, certainly if if he was part of the NHL draft for some weird reason, he would go very high in the draft. So it's really like getting a another top 10 pick because of his age. Um, he, he you know so they really are going to get two first rounders in a way. You can almost look at Truba like a, like a true first-round pick who's going to step in ready to play, uh, a top-10 pick, and then, of course, they have the second pick. So the Rangers are going to make a nice step up to be right part of that bubble. You know, and they knew last year they weren't going to make the playoffs, but now there's something right on that 6-10 to 10 bubble that they can, you know, whether it's injuries or performance from unexpected places or down year from a dependable guy, that, you know, that kind of determines whether you finish 6th or whether you finish 10th. So uh, they're right back in that mix now. Yeah, Devin, you mentioned Philadelphia before. If I had to say two teams that didn't make it last year in the East that could make it again in 2020 would be definitely Philly. I would throw in the Rangers now with that trade, but to me their goaltending has to be a little bit better. Henrik Lundqvist has to turn back the clock a little bit for me if the Rangers want to get back to the postseason. What do you think about the Rangers going into the next year and any possible moves for them? Yeah, I mean, it's just that, that division is loaded. It's going to be hard, you know, Penguins and Capitals and Blue Jackets and Rangers. And, you know, you mentioned the Flyers, and, and uh, it, it's tough. I mean, if you look at the depth in the East, um, you know, Carolina's coming. Certainly you still have, you know, Toronto's on the rise. They're a lock. Tampa Bay is still a lock. Boston is probably a lock. There's three teams. Capitals are four. You know, that was only, that was only four spots. And, again, you have the Penguins. You'd think they'd probably be, would be the fifth team. Okay, now you're down to three spots. And you have all these teams, Columbus, Philadelphia, both New Yorks. The Devils are coming with Jack Hughes. Um, it, Carolina, we mentioned, certainly as a team you could see repeating, possibly, although they could have a down goaltending year. Peter Morazic has proven to be inconsistent throughout his career, so they could be back to a non-playoff team. But it's tough. It's 
really, really packed, and you've got to get off to a good start. And that's what will make the start of the regular season next year really interesting. If the team gets off to a bad start, you know, again, what happened with the Blues, changing coaches, winning the Cup, and how important it is that first month of the season, you've got to be in position by Thanksgiving. Or it's, it's tough to come from behind. You wonder if we could see a lot of coaches go quickly if a team feels like, hey, we're on the wrong track here a month, then we've got to change it now or we're toast. Yeah, we did see just see that with the Blues and the Craig Berube there. There's a team in the Eastern Conference you did not mention, and I think they are certainly a candidate to sign both Artemi Panarin and Sergei Bobrovsky, and that's the Florida Panthers with Joel Quinville. They have to be in the conversation among those bubble East teams. What do you think the future holds for Panarin and Bobrovsky? Do you think they are possible to go to Florida or elsewhere? Well, certainly it's possible. I don't see why not. Um, you know, it's a tax-free state. Uh, the Russians seem, seem to like Florida. Uh, they like the weather. They like the scene. They like the cosmopolitan scene of it. Um, so certainly I think there you know, will be big city hunting for Panarin, whether it be Chicago or New York or L.A. or London. So, um, yeah, they, they certainly I, I pick them every year. I'm a sucker for Florida every year to make the playoffs, and they always disappoint me. You know, with Bart Kopp and all those forwards, and obviously goaltending was a problem for the last few years. They just don't have it now. And if they were to get Bobrovsky, then they certainly would be a legit playoff team. If they don't, though, they're you know they probably have a tough time doing it. So, uh, yeah, they really need to get Bobrovsky, and um, I assume they will. He'll be the first priority. They have to get him, and I'm sure they would love to get Panarin too. And that would really you know jump them up. In fact, as it would jump up the Rangers. Uh, and, and their playoff chances or, you know, or anybody else where he might go to the East or out in the West. If he goes to Chicago, I think Chicago instantly goes back into a good playoff bubble position at, again, 6-10 to 10 area where you can make a move. Uh, uh, and Or if he went to Los Angeles, same thing. The Kings could possibly return to that 6-10 to 10 area and, and be a, in, in the hunt for the playoffs. Use the draft pick, use a free agent like Benarin and bam, you make a big move pretty quickly. So, yeah, he's a key guy as we look to forecast playoff teams. That's why we really have to wait for the draft and the free agency to have serious playoff discussions among teams. Yeah, and then another team you brought up before was the Pittsburgh Penguins. Phil Kessel vetoes the trade to Minnesota that would have gotten Pittsburgh back um, Jason Zucker. What do you think the plans are for the Penguins this offseason? It's tough, you know. Certainly we've seen the Kings and the Blackhawks fall off the map quickly after winning multiple Cups. And certainly the Penguins have to be, you know, wary of that. Do we keep Malkin and Crosby and just kind of save this thing out? Or do we trade Malkin and, and try to get younger and, and try to get a couple different pieces and get a different look before it's too late? Uh, it, it's a tough decision, you know. He's certainly an all-time Penguin great. He's been there for cups, and, and it's tough to trade someone like that. You know, season ticket holders like those guys. They're popular, and you don't want to mess it up. He still could have five good years left. So, it's, you know, do we spill around these guys and, and try to get lucky with the right free agent? Um, but, yeah, they have to have concern. They don't have a Stanley Cup defense anymore. Certainly treading Mata uh, and, and, and improving that spot is certainly one way to look at it. They need a tank for a full season. Dumoulin's solid. Um, he, he's a guy they can count on. But, you know, they just haven't had a, a Stanley Cup defense. You know, the year they won it, they really had a, you know, a good cast of characters back there. But it's a tank and a good, and Trevor Davey was good, and Otto was young, and he was good, Kim was young, and he was good, so they just kind of return, somehow build that roster, and that's the big question, do you trade a big piece, or do you try to fill it around and get lucky for, for another cup? Yeah, they're going to be an interesting team to watch. How about the Bruins? Do you think they just run it back, or do you think they make some changes after losing the Stanley Cup Final? I think for the most part, they'll run it back. They're going to try to add a wing here, obviously, they need someone who can score, um, a little bit and help their five on five. It's you know, the big line. You could really focus on them, and then the rest of the roster. It's good, but not real, real dangerous. I'm sure they would like to add a winger. They hope Jake DeBrusque probably continues to evolve. And you know, he had a real good year this year in the regular season. Struggled in, in the postseason again. Might have been injured. Was very young. So uh, certainly they have DeBrusque. The fourth line, and Corrales, a good fourth line center. He won't be for a long time. And Charlie Coyle really stepped in and looked like he maybe has finally elevated his game where people think it might be as a good third-line center. Uh, you know, they could trade Tory Krug. He's at one year left. He's going to demand a big price tag, but he becomes a free agent. They could possibly use him to get a wing, a young wing, 
and uh, and then try to because they do they are pretty stout on defense. Uh, they have some little bit of depth there. Um, but Charlie McAvoy certainly can run the power play and be a big number one guy. So they could trade Tory Krug to get that winger. Um, so it, it'll be you know salary cap wise, they're in a decent spot. They got good deals on Marshan and Pasternak, and um, you know Charlie's salary is starting to go down now as he ages. So uh, they're you know they're always in a good spot because you know, they've been having to sign that eleven million dollar guy. You know they got they got a lot of guys at the sixes, which really helps them accumulate talent. Yeah, the Bruins are a team that is absolutely loaded, I think, on defense and should be good going into next year. How about the Tampa Bay Lightning? When I had you on last time, I remember we thought that they were pretty much a lock to come out of the East. Then they get swept by Columbus. What do they do this off season? Yeah, and then again, they're, they're, you thought they might be in the Eric and Carlson mix, the Carlson mix, but Carlson signs with uh, San Jose. So, um, you know, certainly they're still a very, very good team. Uh, very deep, great goalie, um, you know, stout defenseman, all-star forward. So there's not going to be much change there. You know, obviously the point contract will, will hurt their salary cap issues, but they got Coburn at a lower number as he resigned, and so it was just a matter of you know trying to keep the guys they have and, and keep everyone there. And then at some point, you you do, you might have to change it a little bit to wake up the team and say, I guess this, maybe this combination isn't going to work. I would think, for the most part, they're going to give this same team another one more run, and uh, until they would do anything drastic. So I think we're going to see the same Tampa Bay team roll out there next year, and you know, try to repeat the regular season, and just obviously a different result in the postseason. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people will be picking them to come out of the East next year, along with teams like the Bruins and whomever makes some good moves in the off season. You mentioned the Sharks and Eric Carlson. How much longer do you think this window is for this Sharks core? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a new core because, you know, you wonder if Thornton will retire, if, if, the, if they'll move on from Pavelski, um, unless they can get him at a number that they want. You know, it's really going to become Hurdle and Carlson, and uh, it's going to be kind of their team. Obviously, Burns is there for a while, still in his prime. And so it's going to kind of, you know, they got Logan Couture, but he's going to slowly slow down. He's not, you know, not a great skater, but he'll always be, he's, he's not going to age great here. His window is certainly uh, perhaps in that area where it's not too much longer. So it's going to be interesting to see what the Sharks do. If, like I said, if Thornton and Pavelski aren't back, he's going to have a, it's going to have a different look. Um, they got Evander Kane, obviously. And I mentioned Hurdle, and they got you know Burns and Carlson. Still, still a very good team, but it, it, it could look a little different. And uh, so again, you're not really sure on them until, uh, until all the all the pieces settle after free agency. Yes, and how about Jordan Binghamton? He's a restricted free agent. We talked about him earlier. What do you think the price will be for the Blues for them to pay to uh, lock him up long term? Yeah, it's just a matter of like, what do we go? You know, do we go three years at five million a year or five point five? You know, do we do we lock them up for you know long, long term, big seven year deal uh, at six or like you know it, it's he's, you know he's still just a young guy, really hasn't proven himself long term. So I just wonder if they go two years just to see, just to make sure and, and what he's going to hold out for, and or will they make the investment in their longer term? You know, seven years at you know five and a half, as opposed to because then if, it, if he works out and continues to play great, you have a goalie at a pretty good cap number. You can really control that goalie cap number. It's big because if uh, if they're good, then you have a huge value there, and if they're not good, you're not stuck, kind of like the Devils are with the you know, Corey Schneider, this giant cap number, um, but it's not resulting in team success and. That, that makes it really difficult to build your roster. So that's, I would think, you're always better off if you're a team. Keep it, keep it at just two years, manage this cap, and then if he becomes a superstar, then you have that, and then you, get, you, know, you, you know what the market is anyway. So I would think something short-term first for him would be the smart thing. Yeah, you mentioned that Corey Schneider deal and how much that's hurt the Devils financially. And then even the uh, Devin Dubnik one for Minnesota. That's another one that... He had that big breakout, and then they paid him a long-term deal. And now the Wild are looking to make some interesting moves. So what do you make about that situation? Does Jason Zucker get moved? Yeah, the Wild are going to have a new GM. Uh, 
him. Uh, you know, he's gone through his first year here now, so he can start to implement his players. And he's gonna obviously they've had no team success recently, so this combination isn't working. So standing pat is not usually an option, especially again when the new GM comes in. He's gonna definitely make changes. And you know, the Charlie grade for Ryan Donato was one, and, and they're gonna you know continue to do that to try to get a new mix of players in there. Uh, to make it work, you know, they they they're kind of they got crazy and suit their big cap numbers, so they got to work around that. Um, but yeah, they'll they'll definitely make changes and look look to make some moves. Yeah, that's another interesting team, and in the, a team in the West that a lot of people thought was a cup contender a few years ago, the Edmonton Oilers, who have the best player in the game, in my opinion, in Connor McDavid. What do you think their plans are for the off season? Yeah, they're probably a couple years away still, so obviously they're just going to try to. Try to get better. Try to get deeper. Hope to hit on some things. Um, and it, it, it's tough. You know, Kenny Holland will go in there, and he's, he can be a little bit patient. He's, he's got his resume. He's got his money. So he doesn't need to do anything too rash. He's going to do it probably just the smart way and add a piece here, add a piece here, nothing rash. Try, you know, try to draft young people that can help the team in, uh, in a couple of years. But, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough because you hate to waste the prime of a player like this. Um, and not make the playoffs and not have a chance. But, you know, I think they'll slowly do the right thing and they'll slowly get back on track. But, yeah, yeah certainly rooting for him uh, to have some team success and get in the postseason. Yeah, he's only made the playoffs once in his uh, young career so far. How about the Vegas Golden Knights? That's a team that likes to go big-name hunting. They got Mark Stone at the deadline last year and extended him. What do you think their plans are for the off season? Yeah, I don't think too much. You know, they're they're pretty much capped out. Uh, they have their team. Um, they'll continue to draft and develop. Um, you know, keep on as many picks as they can and use them and, and have the guys in the minors eventually start to come up and, and fill out the process. You know, the whole expansion process helped them a lot, gaining draft picks, taking on contracts, and taking picks along with it when they you know, they had the they had a zero salary cap. They could do that, but those will come off the books. And the guys on the books now, obviously, uh, the big numbers they have, Patrick Reddy and, and Stone, uh, they're in a juncture long term. They're in a pretty good position. they got guys lined up all the way down. They've guys playing college hockey now, young prospects, who slowly each year threaten to make the lineup. And, um, and they have some, some good core, a good team right off the bat, but a goaltender who still should have uh, some good years left, Mark Andre Fleury. So, yeah, they're in a, they're in a great position. Uh, now, it's a good team and a, a, a playoff team, and also they can continue to focus on scouting and drafting and picking a good second, third, fourth rounders. They can be a little bit bold, maybe, um, and, and really take some chances on some guys who can hit big, um, but also take the stable number two, three defenseman. Hey, here's a guy we can plug in. He can play for 10 years. Might not be a superstar, but we know he can be reliable. We can take him with a first-round pick. Only a second round pick or another team might be looking for more flash. So, uh, yeah, Vegas is in a great, great position. Yeah, I agree with you about them. A team that I'm unsure what they're going to do this offseason, they haven't made the playoffs in so long, and that is the Arizona Coyotes. They were in the mix for a while last year. What do you think they're up to this summer? Yeah, they were just, you know, accumulating talent. Uh, you would think at some point it would be a good free agent destination uh, with the good weather. And some young, some good young players around there. Um, you know, they've been big in the analytics game and, and, and taking young guys. And Clayton Keller kind of took a step back, uh, which was kind of disappointing, probably in their eyes. So, uh, yeah, you're constantly reevaluating each of your players on the roster, what you need, um, you know, where the holes are, and eventually they would like to land a free agent. Obviously, they made the trade for Galchen Young. So they're always going to be doing stuff like that. And um, and so yeah, they're a team that people have been kind of waiting on, okay, let's go, it's about time now, and we'll see if they get off to that good start under Rick Tockett. Yeah, and then another team I'm interested to see what they do is the Anaheim Ducks. They have two first-round picks and a bit of an aging core, but they have a good young defense. Do you think they trade one of those defensemen? Yeah, they're probably in a position now they're going to try to get younger quickly and uh, and get that obviously move Corey Perry and, and, uh, and just, you know, obviously gets left to stay next to the end. But, yeah, you use these draft picks, get younger. Dallas Eakins has had success at the minor league level here. So I'm sure it's, it's a whole new era. They're going to try to get young and quick 
and ride their coach here for the next few years. Yeah, and how about the name that could surprise us and get traded? There's always that surprise player that gets traded every year, it feels like. Do you think there's one this year? Do you have a candidate for that? Yeah, there's always that chance. Certainly a Jonathan Huberdeau for the Panthers um, would probably, if, if they're looking to get something um, in return that they feel they need, whether it's a defenseman, whether they need to do that to get a goalie, if they don't get a um, you know, a guy like that who's youngish, that's had a good career, is proving to be productive, that might be able to wait, you know, might be wait to get Jogeny Mulkin. And the Penguins like to say, ah, Jonathan Huberdeau, we can see him being good for five to seven more years, but with Mulkin, uh, so it's a way to create cap space, get a, a young player who's good, in exchange for you know someone like Amalkin just as an example. So uh, you know, there's always a chance. So you know these GMs are going to look and if it's not working to change things up, and, and we, we might see one of those you know nice you know, Johansson Seth Jones trades where you get two really good guys that both teams really needed to get. Yeah, that trade is one that is going to go down, in my opinion. I really liked the, uh, that one at the time for Columbus, and that really paid off for them. And that's what the Truba deal reminded me of a little bit, except there was no forward going back to Winnipeg in return. Who do you think is the biggest name traded this summer? Yeah, well, it would be Malkin. If the Penguins decide to get younger and in great cap space and move on, um, and they can find a team to match. You know, it, it would be it would be him for sure. And, uh, like you, you mentioned, PK Subban. Certainly, I think Nashville could move on from him, and that's always a a good headline. So he's also a possibility. Yeah, PK Subban. I had a guest on a little while ago, a few weeks ago. I threw out the name Cam Atkinson. Maybe if Columbus doesn't obviously bring back Bravovsky and Panarin, and say Matt DeShane goes elsewhere, I could see them dealing Atkinson away and build around Pierre-Luc Dubois and Seth Jones. How about that one? I don't think so. I think Atkinson will be a Blue Jacket for life. Okay. He's got roots there, a long-term deal. Uh, he loves it there. He champions Ohio. He started a business uh, there with a rink. So he's the kind of guy they want to build around. He's one of two eight guys who love to be in Columbus. I think they look at him as a guy who can recruit players to come there. You know, he's going to live there. He's going to have to retire, so he's going to be there. So, uh, yeah, he, I think he's a cornerstone a lot of ways of the franchise, him and Seth Jones, and, and uh, I, don't, I don't see any way they would trade him. All right, and then another name that somebody threw at me as a possible surprise slash biggest name traded, Henrik Lundqvist. I just don't see that one because he has a no-trade clause, and I know the Rangers, I don't know if they really tried to trade him or if they – Asked Lundqvist permission, and he denied it. So I don't think Lundqvist will get moved, but what do you make about that, the possibility of Henrik Lundqvist moving on from the Rangers? Yeah, I think he'd retire before he did that. Um, I don't think he wants to move out of New York. And, and uh, unless the team is absolutely stacked, like the Lightning, and then they're going to got a season-ending injury in February. Rangers had a down year and it didn't work out like the point and they weren't going to make the playoffs and you know Vasilevsky got through and they said well they called the Rangers to say what about Patrick Lundqvist and he looked at that team and thinks hmm, that's a team that can win the cup maybe a situation like that he would take it but I think it would have to be something like that really weird and uh, filled with championship probability for him to do that yeah, that's the only way I could see it, too. Although, I, like I said, I think he's a Ranger for life, like how you think that Cam Atkinson will be a Columbus Blue Jacket for life. So when's the next time you'll be on SportsCenter? Tonight. Tonight? Uh, on tonight? Yeah, it's 10 to midnight, and uh, most nights after. <laughs> and most nights after, yeah. I'll probably be watching tonight. I hope you have a, a good day, and maybe I'll have you on before the season, and we'll recap all the, the summer moves and whatnot. Good to have you on again.